You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. You know, Sandy Mines, one of the things that's critically important to our industry is having robust markets throughout the country that meet the specific needs of buyers and sellers in the footwear space. And we know all this very well on the Fanny side, our the little nonprofit we run out of New York. But there are companies that do a phenomenal job globally of bringing buyers and sellers together in a, a lot of different product categories and today's guest is no is no stranger to being an innovator and a leader in the marketplace space. And so I'm really excited about this conversation and I hope you are. And so I would welcome you to introduce our guest today. Great. Um, I'm excited to have this special guest on today, too, because um, I've known this person and this organization um, for a very long time. And it's really been a journey and a lot of new things to cover today. So um, I'd like to first start out by saying hello and welcome to Kelly Helfman, president of Informa Markets Fashion, um, the organizer of Magic Coterie and Project. Welcome, Pel- Kelly. Hi, Bo. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk today. Good to see you both. Good, Good to, to see, see you. you. Um, we want to start out by, um, before we get into to questions about the show and some of your new initiatives, we'd love to start out by um, having you share a little bit about yourself and your shoe story and how you got into the footwear market. I love that. Actually, a lot of people don't know that one of my first jobs out of college was working for London Soul, the ballet flat company. I ran their e-commerce out of a small little retail shop on Montana Avenue in Santa Monica. So I went to uh, University of Arizona and got a film degree, did nothing with that, of course. My mom was super (laughs) stoked and got into fashion. I grew up, my mom had a vintage clothing store. I worked in retail all summers and just decided, what am I doing? I want to be in fashion, not film. So I worked for London Soul, learned a ton about the footwear industry and their production and e-com. It was right when it came out. And then uh, I had my own clothing line eventually when... Gosh, I was 24. So this is, now you can age me, 2006, I decided to fold my clothing line and apply for a job in fashion, which was a customer service rep at Magic. So, oh, wow. so, so crazy. Um, so I have been with this company since 2006, 17 years. And I started at the bottom, working my way up, and now I oversee the entire fashion group. So although I worked in um, footwear within selling it in retail and for a brand, I really learned about the entire industry in these past 17 years working for all the different companies because we went through acquisitions, right? I started off with a parent company called Advanced Star. Our primary business was Magic. While it was Advanced Star, we acquired project. Then we acquired e k which is the organizer of Coterie um, and Intermezzo and Soul Commerce. And then we ended up acquiring business journals, which had fame, accessories, the show, Moda, and a few other ones. So um, as most people know, we then got, we got acquired by a company called UBM and then Informa acquired UBM. So I kind of feel like I won this game of Survivor and I'm one of the last on the <laughs> island. And... <laughs> It's so crazy that, you know, I've I've been through all these acquisitions, whether it was buying businesses or businesses acquiring us, um, and I've really seen the depth of it. So as you know, we we acquired the group that did WSA, and then that we launched um, FM Platform, and then at some point that really dissolved into the shows, the footwear group went into magic, went into project, went into coterie. And so we made sure to merchandise it appropriately into the shows at some point. So lots there, but I am definitely familiar with footwear (laughs) through those 17 years of the shows and being a part of that and working with tons of brands, men's, women's, all categories, different price points. And of course, all of the retailers that we serve. 
Yeah. Wow. So as you're walking us down memory lane, Kelly, I was thinking to myself, I remember that. I remember when that happened. I remember when that happened. I've been in this job 14 years. Um, Sandy's been in the industry even longer, so she remembers it all. Uh, and so it has been a crazy ride. And it just shows you the, the dynamic nature of the show business, uh, if you will, just kind of built into the nature of the business. But let's set this past aside and talk about the new initiatives, the things that you all are working on in 23 and heading into 24. The landscape is constantly shifting and changing. And one of the things I think you all do well is trying to anticipate the needs of the industry before maybe the industry even knows that they need them. So talk us through kind of what's on your radar right now and how are you strategizing to ensure that four companies gosh, around the globe, have access to great product. Buyers can come in and see great product. What's, uh, what's your play for the next year or two? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're always strategizing very far in advance. Right now, I'm working on my three-year plan through 2026. So there's that. Um, and it is all driven by the customer, right? And so we have this really robust database of retailers, manufacturers, and brands that we're always talking to, reaching out, understanding their needs, how their business is shifting. And that's really how we're making decisions into the future. So whether you know we're a publicly traded company or not, at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we're addressing the ever-changing needs of this fashion industry, the community. And we all know so much has changed in the past 10 years with e-com direct to consumer. But then, you know, post-pandemic, things have changed too. There's been a lot of consolidation, shifts in strategy, wholesale versus, you know, the budgets where people are going. They really want to diversify their revenue. Um, every single retailer we have that's a brick and mortar also has an e-com. So that's almost like two opportunities for these brands to sell. So we're looking at the business entirely different than when I got this business in 2020. Um, and it's actually really exciting. So I think the biggest shift for us moving into 2023, 2024 is how do we help our brands, not only with their wholesale business, but also their direct to consumer business. And at the end of the day, we have to think about the omni-channel approach and we are known to help them with their wholesale business. Traditionally, you know, these trade shows have been order writing trade shows, but they really are shifting to be more than that. They're marketing events now, and that's important. And we have to educate our customers, our brands that are, you know, paying us for boost space that, that, that this pattern of buyers coming to just write and leave is very different now. They often are exploring. They want to touch and feel the orders come in after they, um, do a lot of marketing. They want to know that you're showing up show after show. They want to see how they can work differently, drop shipping, all the things, right? And so we do a ton of education right now to inform people how you need to show up differently at the shows, how you're going to be successful, what those expectations should be, and how we're going to help you. For example, huge, robust influencer program to help them with, you know, what influencers to partner with to help their direct-to-consumer business. That's very different than what we were doing five, 10 years ago, because... Yeah. We can be the connector of that. An influencer is like a buyer in a way. They're just moving product differently. And so having a robust program there um, in the next year, building that out right now, obviously looking at stores that are going to shop our show on a very different level. There's a big push now for international to come back. So post pandemic, we were really focused more on regional people who could drive in and that wouldn't feel comfortable um, and then expanded that out again to the full US. And now we're actually doing these major, major marketing campaigns to get our international buyers back to Coterie, to Project, to Magic, to sourcing, to shop. Um, also, the co-location of our shows is something we're going to really be working on in the next year of, we can't forget that what makes like a Las Vegas marketplace very special is that the magic and project shows are co-located with sourcing at Magic. And there is a big opportunity for the brands and the footwear community to be able to shop all the footwear manufacturers, fabric, trim, et cetera, in the hall next door. And so really helping people with that um, and that co-location is key moving forward. And our footwear uh, offering in sourcing is major. It's come back since the pandemic. So we, and we have a ton of different companies that um, 
are from different countries, not just Asia. And it's very diverse with smaller minimums and it's exciting thing with different technologies. So it's all this kind of re-education of what the shows are offering today and how we can help your business. You don't have to go to sourcing now and have a hundred thousand minimum. You can do a 250 to 500, you know, um, order and, they're really willing to work from a country like Peru or, you know, all these all these different opportunities for our groups. I would say, last but not least, we're looking at different regions. And we most recently launched Nashville. We just came off our second show. It has been a huge success. And I think of that's, again, from listening to the customers, listening to the buyers on the different opportunities and what they're needing for their businesses and, and really launching net new shows or products that can help them. So that was a lot, but there's yep. a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it's interesting that you say that um, you're looking at international and bringing that back because I've, I've been hearing the same um, a little bit from our brands and retailers that we work with at Fanny, right? Um, we, we obviously have um, some similar, um, ideas about what we need to provide the brands and retailers um, and your team in a much maybe larger way, in a different way, in different locations and areas at different times of the year. Um, I have heard from a lot of people in the industry that Nashville was a big hit. Um, it was really exciting. I, I think it's amazing that you, you saw an opportunity. You took a, you took a chance there. Um, it was probably um, cautious, but a little bit risky at the same time, right? To see what would work and what would not work. And it really went off with a bang. And I, I think after your second show, it really it really has proven to be quite the success. Um, Nashville in itself is really exciting to be there. I, I'd love to come to the next show and visit. But I have heard from many people, both brands and retailers, that it's an exciting show. Um Great new product lines launching there. The town itself is really fun. You guys did a really good job on some new creative experiences there. So kudos to you. I think that was a really um, a nice big win for you. And I'm, I'm anxious to hear on, um, you know, what's to come for that. Are you looking to keep it kind of small and niche or looking to grow it into a much larger show? Tell me a little bit about your strategy in Nashville because I really I'm excited to hear about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was a huge success. We launched it last year in 2022. Um, it was a dream during the pandemic when we were thinking, gosh, we couldn't have shows at the Javits Center in New York or in Las Vegas. Where do we go? Can we pop up different markets to really bring the community together to do business? And at that time, we went to Magic. We did, went to Orlando, remember? And we did Magic Orlando because it was open and the community was dying to come together and do some business. Right. Right. So that got me stirring of like, where else could we go? That's open. And um, Nashville was a no brainer because that city is so hot, not just in music, but in fashion, they have great retail popping up. They're opening, you know, they opened up a Four Seasons, a One Hotel, a Ritz, um, a Ritz Carlton. And you really have to pay attention to these things because our buyers, you know, mom and pop boutiques, they want to work hard, play hard. And why Vegas has always been successful is they can come there, do their shopping during the day. Vegas captures them. Most of our, you know, nobody's from Vegas, right? So they're coming in, you've got them for these two, three days, and they get to have like a girl's trip at night and do and see shows and all the things. So Nashville to me was like, the next best, like, of course we have to go there. It's so hot. Everybody wants to go to Nashville, you know, honky tonk row, music, fashion, culture, food, it all goes together. So we were lucky enough to get space at Music City Center in 2022, which was not easy. They have high demand there. They have one little convention center with not a lot of space. Um, and they were incredible. We got a tiny section and that, I think we had at the point like 200 brands for our first launched with a huge wait list. People were excited to test it out. Um, and it was such a huge success that I begged that convention center for more space for our second show. And I got whatever I could take. And we sold that out right away with a big wait list. Um, we came back with almost 500 brands. So we were over double the size in brands and square footage because I'm like a real estate agent at this point. I wow. That's big. Yeah. So the footwear, the, the footwear assortment doubled. Um, the retailers came out again, so excited. And we just made sure we had a great, you know, half the show was new, obviously. So that was great. And we made sure to really play into the town. So 
doing our opening night party and walking distance on Honky Tonk Row and having live, you know, it, at Magic in Las Vegas, we typically have DJs spinning and, you know, a big performer, like a rapper or somebody really relevant. But, you know, in Nashville, we played into live music all three days on the show floor with local artists, right? And we played into a lot of Nashville um, fashion. So, our footwear assortment was really heavy on the cowboy boots and it all, everybody really brought their Nashville vibe collections, whether it was ready to wear footwear. It was just so fun. Um, our Instagrammable moments, this is an opportunity for boutiques and brands to come in and capture a lot of content. So again, that's changing of what, what our shows offer. It's not just an order writing show and, you know, a business transactional show. It's like, come get content, show your consumers, ask them what styles they like, get live feedback. Like, we have this really youthful team that works on our shows and they're pumping in these new ideas of how to really get retailers and brands to get the most bang for their buck out of these shows. And it re that's when I say it's a marketing event too. Like we create these great content opportunities for people to just get so much more than I'm going to write orders for my store and meet new brands, right? Um, so it was fun. We had, I mean, some of the footwear brands that came were like Mia, Matisse, Bed Stew, Free People, all of our faves. Um, we had Jason Momoa's brand on the Rome. So that was exciting. Mm -hmm. And then like a local Nashville brand, we had Planet Cowboy who has, you know, a great retail store in Nashville of their own on 12 South, very relevant there. So it was a good assortment. We've heard nothing but great feedback. So hopefully we can keep going back there um, and growing that show. But it is something that we're looking at moving forward of, are there any opportunities that our customers are looking for across the U.S.? Um, internationally that serve these different markets that there's a gap that we can do. And that is, you know, there's pros and cons of being a big company, right? Fanny, a little bit more nimble, you know, small, and, and there's the advantages that up there. We can't act as fast sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. We try to act like a small company, even though we're a big company, but definitely have the opportunity to launch new things. We have that investment. We just have to make sure that everybody's on board and we can do that. So yeah. And Wait. you know what? One other thing about Nashville that's really exciting is you, even though it is the magic brand, right? We had some project and coterie brands mixed in there. So it had various price points, um, anywhere from women's trend all the way to women's contemporary footwear and the different categories. So the buyers were able to get a good sampling and shop that high to low. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Kelly. And I think um, the the advantage you all have is that you have the ability to go into these markets and pop something up and be responsive in that way. We're locked into our showroom space and New York will always be New York. We love New York. Oof. It's built on the showroom infrastructure, right? But hitting a Nashville, you know, checking out Austin, you, you could be these quick deploying, particularly as the industry is in this regionalized approach right now. Uh, and you guys took advantage of it, as you stated, in Orlando at the height of the pandemic and now in Nashville. What's the future for Nashville? And then let's not forget our oldies, but our, but our goodies, uh, New York and Las Vegas. Talk to us about the shows in those two locations as we approach the summertime shows. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so Nashville, obviously, we, we hope to be back. We haven't confirmed those dates yet, but I think it's going to be a continuous um, growth opportunity for us and for all of our brands and buyers. I mean, Vegas and New York are our babies, right? And when we really look at what we do best, it's these larger marketplaces that feel small when you're shopping. We're very specific on how we merchandise the shows and curate them. So, you know, they don't feel overwhelming. You know exactly where you're going to go. You know what footwear you're going to find at Magic versus Project and so forth. So, um, of course, we do Vegas twice a year and we do New York twice a year. Vegas is coming up in early August and we always go back every February. And that at some point, I think it was 2019, 2020, when we came back um, and platform merged into the shows. So it's really important that the footwear community who hasn't maybe been to Las Vegas for a while understands that it didn't go away. It just now is segmented appropriately into magic adjacent to the, um, the price points of the ready to wear. And then project has all that footwear sits next to the appropriate denim and apparel. And that really came from our buyers saying we don't necessarily need to be one big footwear show where we go to a separate hall. We kind of want to shop everything in one area. 
So if I'm a women's contemporary sh- um, store, I want to go to Project Women's in Las Vegas and shop my jewelry, my accessories, my apparel, my footwear, all in one section. And it's really and the and the br- footwear brands receive that very well too. They kind of always were interested in going into the show. So it's working great. Um, and it is still merchandised that way. So we'll go back and there's a big assortment of footwear and magic. That's more like trend, fast fashion, a young contemporary, all women's. And then over in the North Hall for project, you have a large, more contemporary assortment of footwear, um, as well as magic men, some more of the traditional men's footwear and some dual gender contemporary footwear as well. And then of course, in sourcing, we have that big assortment of manufacturers who do footwear for our brands to shop while they're there. Um, So we're excited for the first time, actually this August, we're going to do a really big offsite industry event. We actually haven't announced it yet for the, so I don't know if you remember, but back in the heyday with magic, we used to do these like old, like these parties where we would go to a big hotel and have like black eyed peas perform. We're bringing that back. So we put the investment into the show floor at some point and we wanted to keep people on the show floor and that's been working great, but we really want to make an industry event offsite. And so we're going to be announcing our big performer and where that's going to be shortly. So everybody can network. And then of course, Coterie um, and Magic in New York come up in September following Fashion Week. And again, that has the same um, strategy where the footwear, specific footwear sits adjacent to the apparel and accessories in Coterie and in magic to make it really easy for the buyer to navigate the shows and shop. Huge assortment. Um, Obviously, Coterie is more for that higher end, advanced contemporary, um, the brands, and then magic, more that sweet price point, anywhere from modern sportswear to fast fashion footwear. So New York's always going to be very important um, for our industry. Showrooms, like you said, are important. So we see a lot. We work with a lot of showrooms to make it easy for these buyers to go back and forth from the Javits to the showrooms. Um, But really, I think it's reflective of how buyers are shopping. It's high-low. They want a little bit of everything. And so our marketplaces offer that opportunity to shop both contemporary and fast fashion potentially in the same convention center, um, which is really great. That is really great. So Kelly, as we wrap up, what's the best website for potential exhibitors and retailers who are going to shop the shows? What's the best website for them to hit up? Yeah, it's either magicfashionevents.com or coteriefashionevents.com, projectfashionevents.com. Um, they all link to each other. So you'll find us. And I guess the last thing I wanted to say, I mean, follow us on social media for Magic Fashion Events, Project Show or Coterie Show. We're always updating there. And The benefit, I think, for New York, one last thing to add is 30% of over 30% of Coterie is our international brand. So for buyers, it really is cost efficient for them to go to Coterie so they don't have to go overseas to the shows and spend that budget. They could get a great sampling over in New York. Um, And we list those brand lists on all the websites. So you really can get information. Then, of course, for our footwear industry, we're always happy to help on, you know, what brands should do what shows because it's a lot. So our job is to help you guys figure out where you should go, what markets and play best into your strategy. That's awesome. Kelly, thank you so much for coming on Shoe and Show to tell us all the excited things that you're working on right now. We're, we're super excited to continue to partner with you and, uh, and look forward to seeing many of our listeners at these shows coming up. So thanks again for coming on. Thank you for having me and for your support always. Yeah. So folks, this has been another exciting edition of Shoe and Show. Check out shoeandshow.com for all of our episodes. Uh, and make sure that you have subscribed to wherever you catch your podcast episodes so that you get your daily dose or your weekly dose of shoe in every Monday morning. Um, and on behalf of Sandy, Kelly, and myself, Shoe In Show is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.